In my last video, I told about the slow speed of brain impulses and how the brain processes information, two key features of the human brain. Now I would like to tell about two more features, about the brain's power and about an apparent paradox, how the brain prepares to bring things together by processing different kinds of information in different places. So let's look first at the brain's power. That power is impressive. Depending on who you are, it can enable you to learn Chinese, memorize the Bible, win your high school spelling bee, dance Swan Lake, conduct the New York Philharmonic. The list is endless. But if we really want to understand the brain's power, it may be best to start more humbly. For instance, consider the monarch butterfly. The poor monarch's tiny head is almost entirely taken up by its eyes, antenna, tongue, hair, and so forth, leaving almost no room for its brain. But that tiny brain manages to run the monarch's vision and other senses, as well as its legs, wings, flight activities, mating behavior, and so forth, and beyond that, the monarch's brain has enough power left over to migrate this insect through storm and wind all the way from New England to a small patch of forest in the wilds of Mexico. No wonder our brains are remarkable. The monarch has only a microscopic speck of brain tissue, while we have a grapefruit-sized mass of the stuff. Well then, if brain tissue is so powerful, where does the brain get its power from? If we momentarily sidestep the important question of organization, we can say that much of the brain's power comes from its ability to handle data, its vast hoard of neural connections, and we can get a good look at that. Specifically, we can look at synapses, the small gaps between nerve cells that are the human brain's closest equivalent to the yes-no switches found in a computer. It appears that the average neuron has something like 6,000 synapses. And it also appears that the average human brain contains something like 50 billion neurons. So we can speculate that the average human brain has the ability to hold and handle something like 300 trillion bits of data. Now your average desktop computer with 2 gigabytes of RAM can handle up to 16 billion bits of data. If you divide 16 billion into 300 trillion, you can home in on the brain's power by finding that the brain's data handling capacity corresponds roughly to the data handling capacity of a line of computers five miles long. But I would like to try to home in on this another way. A few months back, I was staying with my family at a friend's house in Vermont. It was winter, and I was looking at a big old maple. The tree, about 40 feet wide, was really close to my second-story bedroom window, and I could see the little terminals really well. So I started idly counting terminals. I counted 30, then I found 10 comparable areas nearby, and so I had an area of 300 terminals, and then I found comparable areas with about 300 terminals each, and I wound up figuring that the whole tree had about 6,000 terminals. That struck me as an odd coincidence, because the average neuron has about 6,000 terminals. So, I thought, what if you have another identical tree touching this one? And what if you had a line of these 40-foot wide trees? In that case, you would need 132 trees to go a mile. 5,280 feet divided by 40 is 132. So now suppose you make a line of these trees long enough to go around the Earth, 28,000 miles. 28,000 miles times 132 trees per mile is about 4 million trees. So if you put 4 million of these trees in an imaginary line, ignoring oceans, mountains, and such, this line could go all the way around the Earth. But you don't have 4 million neurons in your brain. Roughly speaking, you have about 50 billion neurons in your brain. So a line of these trees corresponding to the number of neurons in your brain could go around the Earth roughly 13,000 times. 
and if you spread these 13,000 40-foot wide trees out north-south so that they were all just touching, they would form a north-south band nearly a hundred miles wide. So here you have this mass of trees, each with 6,000 terminals, all interconnected, all communicating, a hundred miles wide and 28,000 miles long, a mass of trees so large that by comparison something really huge, say the entire New York metropolitan area, would appear as a small dot. That is what each of you has inside your head, and that's where your brain gets its computing power. Now I would like to turn to something else. I would like to take up the question of how the brain processes different sorts of information. It turns out that the short answer is that the brain processes different sorts of information at different places. That is, the brain is set up regionally with preset arrangements for processing different sorts of signals at different sites. I find this a bit the way the Chinese make textiles for export. It turns out there is a string of Chinese towns and cities along the East China coast that specialize in textiles for export. Each makes something different. One makes socks, another underwear, another shirts, and so on. But the specialization goes deeper, because regions within the same city focus on things like wooden buttons, shirt embroidery, and so forth, and indeed, things get so finely divided that one can imagine finding many small individual enterprises, each specializing in some particular type of work that is exclusively its own. Whether or not this is a fairly accurate picture of the Chinese textile industry, that's how the brain works. In the beginning, when one is looking for major functions in the cerebral cortex, it's not hard to find large areas like Chinese cities devoted to sight, hearing, touch, language, and so forth. Of course, this is not news. Most of us can recall brain diagrams from our school days showing different parts of the brain's surface devoted to such tasks. But this gross regionalization of the brain is only the beginning. Like the Chinese cities, each specialized brain region tends to break down into smaller specialized subregions. Much of this regional processing bears some resemblance to the work of factory assembly lines, but these are no ordinary assembly lines. Take the case of vision, for example. There's lots of feedback as well as input from other areas, and so much visual information is being processed continually that it's more like tens of thousands of complex interrelated assembly lines, each with numerous side assemblies and subroutines. But at least we can see where the visual information arrives toward the rear of the brain, how most of it advances forward along the brain's surface, and where most of it winds up in a visually processed form near other brain regions on the side or top of the head that use some such information to do things like recognize faces. Furthermore, with or without this strike in physical progression, most brain regions appear to follow the assembly line approach. So we can say that to a fair degree we have a sense of how this regional system works and how the brain's regional activities are conducted. This is not the end of the story, far from it. For as anyone can see, all these regional outputs like vision, hearing, touch, emotion, thought, and so forth get tied together in the conscious mind. In fact, they get so tightly bound together as to appear seamlessly coordinated. Brain science doesn't know just how this happens, but it has plenty of good ideas so this matter of coordination is the subject of my next video, the last in this introductory series on exploration of the brain.